Okay, folks, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome everyone on site, welcome everyone on virtual. Uh, my name is Maciej and I'm joined today here by Katrina and Eddie, who are the coaches of Six CLI. Uh, we're missing one person more, who's uh, our dear friend and coacher for Six CLI, which is Sean. Hi, Sean, uh, if you're watching this today, although it might be a little bit late for you, it's like middle of the night in, um, in California. Anyhow, uh, what do we do? So there are two primary things that we are trying to, uh, to work on, which is adding additional tools and libraries to discuss with, uh, to talk with your Kubernetes clusters. And we're basically trying to make them awesome, both for users and for the developers that are building on top of it. If that's too vague, that means we are building kubectl, customized. I don't think I need to, I need to introduce these two. We are also working on crew and crew index, which is a the tool for uh, plugins with uh, for kubectl. Coolio, which is a graphical user interface or a wrapper around the kubectl. A bunch of libraries that you can all use and bu build your awesome tools, even better than kubectl is. And a recent addition, which, which is a KRM functions, uh, which is basically a customized plugin mechanism that Katrina will be talking about in a bit. Um, you can find us all in 6 CLI Kubernetes Slack channel, as well as in a mailing list. And we also meet every week on Wednesdays. There are times, depending on where, uh, which time zone you're in. For all Europeans, since we're in Europe, it's 6 p.m. every Wednesday. And depending on the week, it will be either 6 CLI meeting or uh, customize or kubectl uh, bug scrub. So you can volunteer or uh, work on specific bugs. Uh, what are the main things, Kubernetes enhancements proposal that we worked on in the past couple of releases? That will be kubectl debug, which is still in beta, uh, that helps you work with or debug the problems that you might have with your applications or containers. It heavily relies on ephemeral containers. Um, there's another proposal that we put together just recently about exit code normalization. Mm, we're, help, uh, we're hoping to slowly start implementing the features. If you have some ideas about the exit code normalization for CI usage and so forth, uh, we're more than happy to hear from you. Uh, Nikita and, uh, uh, and her group helped with adding the sub-resources support to kubectl. So she worked both on the server side changes and the kubectl. And like I mentioned uh, a minute ago, Katrina will be talking a little bit more about the, uh, the new customized uh, plugin mechanism. Um, we, are, we also want to use this, uh, this meeting today to call out several people who helped us uh, push certain uh, major changes to kubectl. Uh, firstly, Katrina, who exposed customize directly in the kubectl version. That's very useful because a lot of people were asking frequently which version of customize is embedded, whether you were directly using kubectl or you were building on top of kubectl and vendoring that into your own tools. Uh, so thank you very much for exposing that information. Big shout out goes to Lao, who was very patient with mine, Eddie's, and a couple other folks' reviews and making the kubectl help commands much more readable. Previously, it was packed with tons of information. Currently, it's much more uh, pleasant to the eye. Uh, uh, another uh, amazing shout out goes to Mark, who appeared out of nowhere and uh, improved or revamped almost all of our uh, completions. And not only that, he also improved the kubectl completions and he devoted a lot of his own time and energy into pushing the changes also into Cobra. So if your tool is using Cobra directly, you can also benefit and feel free to shout out to Mark uh, for his awesome work. Uh, Manish Kumar, who had a numerous conversation with me about the discovery cache that we have in kubectl. Uh, which previously was being populated every 10 minutes. We bumped that limit over to six hours. So that should uh, limit a little bit uh, uh, the amount of data that we're pulling from the clusters. Uh, the additional two is uh, Jordan along with the SIGOTH uh, are revamping how we're using secret, uh, secrets and tokens. They're trying to limit the amount of secret tokens that we're using. And so they introduced a new API for requesting tokens and expose that under the kubectl create command. And Jianli um, added a defaulting to the first container and the kubectl logs 
and any other commands which are picking the container um, if a default annotation isn't set. So if you don't know about the default annotation, if your pod has several containers in it, you can annotate, if I remember correctly, that's kubectl uh, kubernetes.io slash default, uh, default container. So all the kubectl logs, exec, and similar commands can actually pick the default uh, container so you don't have to um, specify it in your command line, which hopefully should help you with uh, all of the work. I'm going to pass over to Katrina to talk about the KRM. Thanks, Maciek. So uh, another thing that's new in the SIG since our last update is that we have a new sub-project. It's called KRM Functions, so we thought we'd give you a bit of an intro to this sub-project and uh, what it's all about. The KRM Functions sub-project is based on a specification called the KRM Functions Specification. Uh, it's actually a very long document that you can go and read up on at the link below. It's uh, inside the customized repository. But the most important part of that is the sentence here. It's a standard for client-side functions that operate on Kubernetes declarative configurations. That's pretty dense, so let's dig, dig into uh, what that means a little bit. So first of all, the KRM part, that stands for Kubernetes Resource Model. That means what we're talking about here are uh, declarative objects that take that standard Kubernetes resource format. And the functions part is executable programs, specifically ones that are built to be small, interoperable, and language independent. All of that, uh, the, the, and these uh, functions specifically, they're, they're there to operate on these Kubernetes resource model objects. That might sound a little bit like a controller, but the third part uh, is, is a, a key distinction here. These are built for use on the client side, not on the server side. Specifically, they're meant to be chained together as part of a configuration management pipeline, so in tools like Customize. And in fact, this is actually a way to build customized extensions and also extensions for another tool called Kept in the configuration management space. It's an open standard, which is really cool, so we can build these functions in a way that they'll, interoper they'll be interoperable across these client-side tools. So let's take a look at what this actually might look like in practice. As I mentioned, the heart of the specification is around using KRM-style uh, objects on the client side. So we're using them not just because that's what we're manipulating, because we, what we're goal here in configuration management is to produce a set of configuration that we're going to deploy. Not only that, we're actually using these declarative specifications to describe the operation that we're going to do with our function. So in this case, we're going to do something super simple. We have our value annotator kind, and it's just going to inject this very important data as an annotation on all of our resources. So this is our specification here telling us what our function needs to do. But on its own, this wouldn't be enough for our function to do its work. Because what is it going to operate on, right? We need the list of resources. We're on the client side, so that actually needs to be given to us. So what the specification says is that you actually use a kind called resource list, which is a standard list kind, um, that is going to contain not only that function configuration telling us what to do, but also that input list of Kubernetes objects that we're supposed to operate on. So our function is going to take this resource list as its input. It's going to do whatever the function config tells it to do. And then it's actually going to use the resource list kind as its output as well. And that comes back to the uh, core principle of making these things chainable. So you have your output items. And you also have a field uh, where you can put structured results. Because one of the use cases for KRM functions is validation. So you might need a, a structured way to describe the results of a validation operation. And that's what that field is there for. So in practice, uh, not only do you have the function config as your input, you have this entire resource list. So in our example here, we're going to operate on just a very simple list of one item, one config map, and we have our same function config that we saw before telling us to add that important data as an annotation. So we're going to take that as our input. We're going to apply the transformation to it. We're going to emit another resource list with a transformed config map with our important data right in that annotation as our output. So a very simple example of how a KRM function can work. What this looks like in practice, um, it's customized and kept are the two tools that are uh, driving the function specification. So uh, we're going to take a quick look at them. Uh, in customized specifically, we have uh, on the right-hand side there a customization.yaml that is referencing an annotator.yaml which we have on the left, it's that same specification of what the uh, function is supposed to do. You can, uh, here we have it referenced in the transformers field. As I alluded to a moment ago, you can also build validators this way, so it works in the validators field. 
and it also works in the generators field if you are creating resources. So customization, in, if in your customization.yaml, there's the three places where you can use it. Um, for customize, however, you might notice there's an additional stanza here uh, in the annotations of your uh, configuration object. You have this config.kubernetes.io slash function annotation that refers to container. And that's because in customize, we don't know where the code you wrote is. You have to tell us. So uh, this is the function uh, annotation that we're using to do that. And here we're pointing to a Docker image. This is not super elegant, especially because the folks writing the functions probably aren't the same ones that are consuming it. So we want to make this a lot nicer. And we have some big plans around that area. I don't have time to get into all the details here, but there are three separate keps around this, uh, around this plan for making customized uh, extensions great uh, using the Karam function specification. The top level one is this uh, plugin graduation. That's sort of the umbrella cap that describes the overall arching plan. And the other two go into details about uh, specifics uh, that have to do with making that plan successful. So if you're interested in customized extensions and Karam functions as they relate to that, check out these caps. And then uh, since kept is the other tool that supports the specification right now, I thought I'd also uh, just show off what it looks here. Very similar. Again, you have your configuration object, and you reference it in, in this case, a kept file. Uh, and you're also pointing to the image that does the implementation. So very similar. And the great thing about having an interoperable focused standard is that not just these two tools, but any other tool that is operating on the client side and is in charge of manipulating some Kubernetes configuration, very common task we all need to do, uh, can adhere to the specification. And then we can write tools that we can then share, uh, KRM functions specifically, that these tools can share uh, to implement common uh, needed logic. So the subproject uh, of SIG CLI, the KRM function subproject, was actually created to host the code for the new KRM functions registry. This was also proposed in a KEP. And the idea here is that we're going to have a SIG CLI sponsored registry of KRM functions that are useful to everybody and that can be shared amongst the, the tool, two tools for starters, customized and kept, but also any other tools that adopt the standard. So a good example is that currently customized and kept both have independent, independent implementations of a Helm function. And we are moving uh, those together into the functions registry to make one much better one that they can both use. So uh, this is a very new initiative. We're still getting this spun up. So that also means that it's a great uh, avenue for getting involved in the SIG. If you're interested in the standard, if you're interested in the functions, if you have a configuration management tool that you think could benefit from uh, operating this way, come talk to us. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And on that note, we have a bi-weekly meeting. It is at these times listed here, which you can also find in the official SIG CLI meetings calendar. And with that, I will hand it off to Eddie. So I have a couple more slides, and then we have plenty of time for some discussion and questions. Um, I got to stand on the soapbox for a minute, though. We have to talk about declarative versus imperative workloads. Uh, this is something that comes up quite often, and uh, we just wanted to give the community a reminder about it. So I'm going to talk about three different management techniques. Uh, there's a note that these management techniques should not be mixed. Uh, you should only work with resources that were created and operated on by one technique. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you do mix them, the result is undefined behavior. So you will probably break things. So the first technique here is, is when you're operating with just imperative commands. So this is your create, replace. And so this is where you are manually on the command line interface doing a create deployment dash dash image and giving it an image. You are operating here on live objects. And this is great to use when you are developing. Uh, we do not recommend that you use these commands at all when you are working with production resources. So great for developing, don't use in production. Uh, this obviously has the lowest learning curve, which is why most people jump to this. Uh, but it's really important to learn some of these other techniques. The second one is um, imperative object configuration. So this is where you are writing your Kubernetes resource YAML out to a file, and then you are doing create-f and replace-f. This is great to use uh, because you are uh, replacing your resource in the cluster completely, right? So it blows it over, it paves over it, but this is still actually an imperative operation. And it will potentially leave you in a, uh, a mixed state depending on what the resource was before. It doesn't take into account anything that was there before. If you had gone in and you had done a set image, um, this will replace it. If you had set an auto scale manually, if you've done cube control scale, uh, this will overwrite it, right? So this is a complete replace. Again, you don't want to mix these commands. 
And the last one is the one we actually recommend you use and really want you to use, which is full declarative object configuration. So this is using cube control apply. Quick show of hands, who uses apply? Great, that's awesome, keep using apply. So this is where you have your file written to disk, you are using cube control apply, and it does a three-way merge with an annotation get, that gets written to your object state in the cluster. And so this is the last known apply configuration. And I'll talk about that in a second. So declarative commands, there's only one. It is cube control apply. Please use cube control apply. Uh, it is not good to mix these commands, obviously, but this is what we want people using. This is the best way to manage your Kubernetes resources. You would run this inside of your GitOps pipeline, right? Your state lives in your file on disk. There is never a question on where the source of truth is. It will always match the file on the disk and the file in your cluster. And again, if you make imperative operations on that resource, it will blow away that annotation, so your three-way merge will fail. These are imperative commands. Who here uses these in production? Couple folks? Yeah. So these are not ones that you, you want to use in production. Uh, did folks know that kube control rollout undo is a imperative command? Yeah. So this is a command where if you made a mistake or you realized during a rollout that uh, maybe you had the wrong image configured or production is coming down, uh, you would use rollout undo. This definitely breaks things because this will uh, blow away that last known apply configuration. We've actually had an issue that had a ton of community back and forth um, because it is a very convenient command, but it's not one you should be using. You should be redoing your apply. Your, your, your undo should be a git revert and then reapply in your pipeline. Right, so again, these are the imperative commands, great for development, uh, please don't use them in production. Again, so this is the annotation I was talking about. So mixing cube control apply with the imperative object configuration commands, create and replace is not supported. This is because create and replace do not retain the last applied configuration annotation that cube control uses to compute updates. Please use apply. Cool, so uh, just some items top of mind before we get into our discussion. Uh, we have been in the progress of refactoring our cube control commands. Does anyone right now depend on cube control code in their applications? Any folks? Yeah, so there's currently not a guarantee that uh, we won't break things with cube control commands. We provide no SLA. Uh, we want people to use them and, and give us feedback. Uh, but again, we may need to refactor a command and it might break. Uh, we want to get to the point where we consider the cube control library code stable that other people can consume. So that's what this uh, big refactor has been to move towards a kind of interface style that we want for a command. Uh, and once that's done, we will definitely call it stable and let folks know that they can start consuming it. Uh, the next thing we're thinking about is a better way to handle flags. So structured data, like Kubernetes resources, is not made to be represented on terminal flags. If you think about a full deployment resource, and you think about all the flags that you would need to specify to do a create with that, it is awful. It is terrible for maintainer uh, overhead, uh, and it's just not, it's not meant to be represented that day. So we are trying to think through a way to make this better for folks. Um, this really comes from a place of where we have some flags for some create commands, but not all the, the full fields in it and people always uh, open an issue, the community opens a PR to add a new flag, and we've opted to not merge these right now just because we really don't want to bloat the, the flag space of the commands, so please don't take that personally, don't take offense to it. Uh, we really just need a better way to do this overall, so if you have ideas, please let us know. Uh, we also want to work on a cube control generate type command where you can scaffold out a template, so a lot of folks would do like a a dry run, create, and then write that out to a file on disk. This is what they recommend you doing if you're studying for the, the CKA, um, whatever it's called. Um, we want to find a way to take open API example data and help use that to create temp, uh, templates and scaffolded out files on the disk. And so this is great for CRDs because CRD authors can specify exactly what they want via the open API spec. So if anyone's interested in working on that, please let us know. Um, we are, as a project, focusing on project reliability. Uh, we have a lot of things that aren't tested or tested poorly. 
Um, we will not be accepting PRs that don't have tests. And in fact, if, if you are making a PR to a command that doesn't have tests, uh, we will push back and ask you to add tests for the command. Uh, this is kind of just a stance we've taken as a project to you know, not think in the future these tests will get added, but we will need them added at time of PR. So there's a reliability bar kept that's open and then an open letter from a bunch of us maintainers. Um, so again, this is not personal to you, this is not offensive, we just need to uh, stabilize the core as a product and make it uh, more sustainable for everyone in the long run. So if you get pushback, uh, please don't take offense. Um, lastly, we have a, a customized documentation revamp. So shout out to the replicated folks, go check out their booth. Uh, they donated uh, customized.io and kubecontrol.io to us as a project. So we plan to uh, redo all of the uh, SIG CLI documentation. Customize is definitely in, in need of a, the biggest revamp. So that's where our efforts are gonna be first. So uh, if you would like to participate in that, please let us know. And then new contributors. Who here has contributed to any SIG CLI code before? Woo, can I give them a round of applause? Yeah. Thank you. So as a project, we are in dire need for new contributors. Uh, folks want to step down from maintainer and lead positions, but don't actually have people to hand off to. So if you are interested in contributing, uh, please join us at any of our SIG meetings, any of the other SIG meetings. You can find them all in the Kubernetes community repo. Talk to your managers, talk to your VPs, see if they'll support you 20% time, 50% time, whatever you can ask for. Uh, please let us know, especially if your company sells products or services in the Kubernetes space. So we really need some new contributors. Uh, we are absolutely open to mentor and bring folks on as maintainers. Uh, we have mentoring cohorts that are starting. The only thing is we need a commitment that folks aren't gonna disappear after one or two PRs. That's the quickest way to lead to maintainer burnout is where we're constantly training new people and then they disappear. So please join us and, and please make a firm commitment to, to help us out. So uh, with that, we got a bunch of time for some questions and Q&A. And really, we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear the things that you're struggling with, uh, the things that you're working on and what you think we should be working on, so. sit in these uncomfortable chairs. I, uh, this is a very important question. Is it Coupe Cuddle or Coupe Control? The release notes of 1.9 say something about that, I think. Much I, would <laughs> I always forget what the verdict was, though. Uh, the verdict is whatever you prefer. <laughs> but no, uh, honestly, uh, both are fine. Although, if you start looking at our logo, which is Cuttlefish, um, yeah, Eddie brought it up. So if you look at Cuttlefish, yeah, it'll be towards QB Cuddle. I purposefully say it differently every time I said it. I don't know if anyone noticed, but I do it to trip you all up. Hello, um, hi, my name is Amrita. I have a question. So um, uh, shortly I had an experience working with uh, Kubernetes and KubeKettle and uh, debugging cluster pods. So um, the problem which I faced is uh, uh, most of the times when mm, the pod deployments fail, it was really hard for um, normal or not very um, um, deep uh, Kubernetes users to debug the logs because uh, the logs, uh, the visibility of the logs or to catch the particular error where it has failed, where the error message is, it's hard to. So, so my question is, is there any um, um, a future um, step or uh, enhancement in, in, in minds to enhance the logs debugging uh, from that prospect? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll take that question as, I'll put half of my uh, SIG CLI and half of my SIG apps uh, chair on, uh, because a lot of the logs and the information that is provided by the cluster relies heavily on the authors of the controllers. Um, so we try to, and, and, and actually we have an ongoing uh, cap in progress where we're trying to unify 
the statuses of all the controllers so that, um, first of all, you could build tools on top of it. The problem that we currently have is that each and every single controller was written by a different person at a different point in time. And that led to the problem that every, control, uh, every author just figure out, oh, I want to know about this state and that state, but there's no continuity and it's hard to follow what's going on with every, uh, every separate controller. We're trying to somehow unify this. This is both for uh, if you're trying to build tools on top of it, but also for new people debugging. If you're, for example, if a newcomer and you start working with deployments, you learn how to work with deployments, but then if you switch over to daemon sets or stateful sets, it's hard because the statuses and the information provided by those controllers are completely different. That's what we're trying to fix, and this will help both users because, oh, I work with deployments, and it should be natural that I more or less know uh, at least uh, the general idea where the, uh, the controller is at or what it is struggling with rather than uh, learning anew entirely what the controller works. Of course, it won't solve all the problems. There will be always some intricacies of every single controller. We can't uh, share everything, but we're trying to improve that situation. Uh, on the CLI front, we are pushing towards the uh, kubectl events command, which exposes that information. And on the uh, controller side, we're hoping uh, through those events and statuses in the, in the controllers, to somehow uh, improve that situation. Also, there's a kubectl debug command uh, that Lee and a couple of folks is helping him. I was just uh, recently uh, reviewing PR and we're hoping to push this forward as soon as ephemeral containers were GA. We're hoping to GA uh, debug, so I'm, I'm pretty happy um, and looking forward to it. <laughs> so there, there is a question here in the virtual platform. Uh, if there are some tips for newcomers on how to get involved with uh, it. Yeah. Okay. So we, uh, that refactor I mentioned, um, we are zeroing in on what we want a cube control command to look like, again, so it can be used by you and your library code. Um, that's probably gonna be the best on-ramp, is once we stabilize and agree on an interface, uh, we have a ton of cube control commands that are gonna need to be rewritten to match the specification. So we will have a, a big issue tracking all of that. Uh, the, really the best place to join us is in Slack or at our meetings. Uh, introduce yourself. The Kubernetes community is exceptionally welcoming, especially to first time people. You'll be asked to just say your name and what you wanna work on at your first meeting. So highly recommend you just jump in and join us. Um, but yeah, that is probably gonna be the best starting point. And it also depends on what your skills are and what you're interested in, because we do have a lot of different opportunities available. So uh, we, we did call out a few uh, different things in, in, the, in the talk there, like the customization, uh, the customized documentation uh, revamp is one that's very accessible. We're basically taking one website and restructuring it into a new place and then launching it fresh. Uh, and that is also like, if you're not as familiar with the tool, you can learn in the process and help us make it better and clearer as we move the, the content over. So like, that's a really good, easy, accessible one. Um, but there's all sorts of different things that you can do, like even helping us with each issue triage, going through and confirming, yes, this actually uh, is still an issue in the latest version. Um, we don't have nearly as many people on the projects as, as we would like to have, so uh, we're very open to various kinds of contributions. Um, and like Eddie said, uh, pointing out to us that you are committed to learning, like if you are going to be around for a while, then we can mentor you, we can help you learn uh, these areas. Uh, we just need to know that that's the case. And an important thing um, that I always repeat to everyone that I'm pinging, uh, I always say that if I review your PR, go find me on Slack because my I already declared bankruptcy and GitHub notifications. My Slack is probably the easiest, but even then, uh, please do not be offended if I disappear for a week or two or a little bit longer. Uh, p just keep on pinging me, I'll get back to it. Sometimes it takes me days, weeks, I it, it there's nothing personal. I'm jumping between my 
professional duties at Red Hat and my community du community duty duties. Like I mentioned uh, earlier before, I'm responsible for two six, uh, for six CLI and SIG apps. So I'm jumping between the topics. It's oftentimes that I'll be um, lefting six CLI behind a little bit because I have Katrina and Eddie and Sean around. And I'm jumping on the SIG apps and trying to push that boat forward. Uh, and I know that the same applies to Katrina, to Eddie, and all the people. There's only a handful of us. Um, and like we said, we need more people. We're more than happy to help uh, uh, on Ramta people. It just takes some time and a little bit more patience. Yeah, exactly. Just be patient with us. We're not, we're not ignoring you on purpose. We will get to you eventually. We really do want your help, and we appreciate their, your patience. Yeah, and we don't just need developer contributions too. So if you have PMs that are interested in contributing to open source, we would love some good PMs to stick around, help us triage issues, respond to issues. Can you please provide us a, a replication example? Um, so yes, PMs, uh, technical writers for documentation. You don't have to be a developer. If you are a developer and you don't know where to start, you can just review PRs on the Kubernetes uh, project itself, right? You don't have to be a project maintainer to review a PR. We welcome and encourage anyone who gets to code to a, a higher bar for us. Yeah, that's a really good one. I have another question. Um, we have an error which we cured multiple times, which is related to um, sealed secrets. So when we do the QCD uh, apply uh, and the secret uh, creation failed uh, to the controller, um, the pod cannot be started. And this is a thing we cannot see when we apply this, even if we have it in the, in the CI pipeline. Are there any plans to, uh, to integrate such as external controllers which are depending on the deployment? That's a, that's a CR that is, if the CR doesn't exist, the deployment can't start? Is that what you're saying? Uh, custom resource, sorry. The sealed secret is a custom resource? Yeah. yeah. A cu so you have a custom resource that creates a, a secret resource that is consumed by a deployment and you don't have enough visibility into the uh, deployment's reason for failing to start, which is not ultimately from the secrets from the sealed secret? Is that, did I understand correctly? Uh, <laughs> I, I, not that I'm aware of, I don't know much. Yeah, that goes back to, the, uh, to what I was talking earlier before about improving the statuses, improving the debuggability. That's the biggest issue. Beforehand, we focus a lot on, oh yeah, adding more functionality, adding more and more and more functionality. Uh, we currently pass a threshold where a lot of people is on uh, on cube is on is using certain tools and we are overwhelmed by oh how do I debug those how do I learn more about what's going on a lot of that information unfortunately is hidden way deep in the controller logs so in in your case that will be in the deployment controller logs and the only way for you to debug is, is to be cluster admin or have access to the controller logs. That's a shame. A similar problem with have, we have with the scheduler, which is a third area that I'm also tightly looking into, but that's because my team is also in, uh, in that area. And we have exactly the same problem. And it, what's even worse is that the scheduler logs to know them you have to bump the logs of the scheduler to the crazy 10 or 12 level, which basically means you're getting incredible, almost unparsable amount of data that you have to go through. And what's more is you're getting that information from all the pods. So tracking that one particular pod that you cared about is very hard. So there is a lot of work around the structured logging on the server side to simplify and help with debugging those. And then on top of that, we will be slowly exposing uh, as much as of the information as we can uh, over to, to the users who don't have that much of uh, access to the cluster. That's a problem and I'm, I'm fully aware of it. I see how my customers are struggling with this uh, from pretty much CLI all the way back to scheduling. Same applies for um, 
uh, on the API side of things, which is another area of my interest. If you have some admission webhooks or any kind of admission plugins that are um, part of the process of applying your resources, they are that information is again lost in the in the API server logs, and you don't have that information. Or because uh, a very frequent case that I, I'm struggling and we're trying to expose that information, uh, garbage collection will stop working, so you can't remove your resources because there's an admission misbehaving. Because garbage collection relies on being able to read all the resources in the cluster and know that, oh, yes, I can safely remove it or not. And if it can't read all the resources, it will just won't remove anything. And you'll have pods in terminating forever until the problem with garbage collection is solved, which go bo boils down back to the API server and the admission, which is uh, preventing the uh, the full discovery from succeeding. Uh, Quota has the exact same problem as well. And yeah, so it's, it's in the works. It'll take some time. Yes, I'm more than happy to mentor folks for both the SIG CLI, SIG apps. It just takes some time. I hope that answers <laughs> at least some of your question. Thank you very much, all.